Words appear, 504 and the ADA. There would be no ADA unless we go back at least a decade or more to the, you know, first of all, the local movements around the country that were starting to kind of spring up around disability rights. And the fact that some activists in Congress kind of stuck in 504 in the Rehab Act. What happened is you had 504 was 35 words snuck into a Rehab Act with no congressional history. So it was a sneak attack. Okay, and I'm not sure anybody other than the people that got the 35 words in knew what the heck they were doing even. So then you had the 504 regulations. If you take 504 the statute and 504 the regulations, you have the basis of the ADA. After 504, I got to say, oh, you really should do this. It's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. And it's the law. Unfortunately, nobody ever heard of 504. You know, it was just not one of those things that entered anybody's consciousness, except for those of us who were intimately involved with it, and maybe the affirmative action officer at the university or uh, the people who were designing the buildings. It wasn't until the ADA came in, really, and that started to get some press that people started to pay attention. So from 77 to 90, we had the law but it didn't have as, it wasn't a very big club. It was an important club to have. It was a, better than having no club at all, but it wasn't a very big club. It was finally when the ADA came in that we got a decent sized club and could make more important things happen. You don't just go like pop it into Congress, you know, in 1988 and say, we want the most comprehensive civil rights law that's ever been passed in the world on disability, unless you spent that decade you know, really establishing the relationships, having people trust you and know that you can, you know, deliver the goods, seeing that there's a community that they can rely on to back the members, to back them up if they're going to, you know, go out on a limb for you. So there was all this groundswell that was created in the 80s through the energy of those demonstrations, through the energy of a new civil rights movement. And I think all of that, um, was absolutely a prerequisite to even thinking about an ADA. I think we went through a lot to get where we are, are but there's always room for improvement. We have, we have a law, that's all, that's all, but it's a base to start building on. It's, it's something to remind people of that there's some basis in law for this. Um, I can't imagine not having it. I just can't, I just can't imagine it. I'll, I'll tell you what I want young people to know, whether they're in the disability community or ethnic communities, whatever, or the women's community. All the legislation that's been passed through in this country to break down barriers and create opportunities didn't happen out of the goodness of the hearts of elected officials. They happened because of the advocacy of people organizing and what people need to be aware of is legislation could be changed at any time and so you always have to be vigilant and be ready to stand up and fight to protect what's been you know gained by other people that came before you words appear in order of appearance arlene meyerson disability rights attorney paul grossman disability rights attorney Anthony Tussler, 504 protest supporter. Jim Ingvall, 504 protester. Herb Levine, 504 protester. Ray Uzetta, 504 protester. Connie Susi, 504 protester. Patient No More is a project created by the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the ADA. PatientNoMore.org. Interviews recorded in 2014 by undergraduate students from Journalism 321, History 484, and staff from the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University. Edited by Hong Cheng. Audio description by Audio Eyes. Description voiced by Herb Merriweather. Copyright Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University 2015.